In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Christ is in our midst. He is in our power. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. It's a hard saying. This whole week we've been preparing for the Feast of the Elevation of the Cross, which we celebrated yesterday. And the readings make it clear to me now that when they say pick up your cross, they knew exactly what he was talking about. We read that he said the Son of Man must be lifted up. That sounds strange to us. He must be lifted up. And it's lifted up on the cross. And they, they rebuted him and they said, the Son of Man is forever. How do you say he must be lifted up? They totally knew what he meant when he says, we must pick up our cross to follow him. And this is something I've, I, I continue to struggle with. This, Like, how do we understand this? How should we understand this? How did they understand it in this generation? When Christ is using these words to, the, to his disciples, and the people listening, they all understood what it means to say the cross. It's, it's interesting. It's, it's a noun, cross, stavros, stavruth, um, stavruth to stay, something like that. They turn it into a verb, and we translate it as crucify. But crucify and cross in the Greek share the same root. One's a, a noun, the other one's a verb. They cross you. And it's not like double crossing, they betrayed you. They, they cross you is to mean they put you on the cross, how we understand, to be crucified. And so, bear with me, I, I still continue to work this out. He says, unless you, anyone who would follow me must deny themselves, pick up their cross to follow me. Well, 2,000 years later, what does it mean to be crucified? We use this as a, an exaggeration to how someone treats us. Oh, they crucified me. No, not literally. Maybe figuratively. They, they humiliated you. They oppressed you. They may have abused you. They may have doubled crossed you, they may have punished you, they literally did not crucify you, but these are some of the ideas we get from what it means to be crucified in today's time in the Western world, unless we're looking in the Middle East where people still get crucified. But with us, to pick up our cross to follow him, it doesn't share the same weight of oppression and persecution as it used to. Especially during the time of Christ, especially during the first two centuries after Christ, where they would literally crucify you for being a Christian. They would literally cut off your head for being a Christian. But we share rights and liberties here in the United States to be a Christian, any kind of Christian, or not a Christian, or something even completely different or nothing. We have that right and the protection, the legal protection. But I think there's still the same element of humiliation, fear, persecution, oppression for being a Christian that we may kind of experience in our own head. Do we feel free to express our faith? What are the three things we shouldn't talk about at parties? Religion, politics, sex. And even that, well, we could talk about sex these days. And politics, we're all in trouble. <laughs> we can agree on that. <laughs> My brother said, who are you going to vote for? I said, I want to write your name in. And he can write my name in. And <laughs> but to pick up your cross. You know, I have a little anxiety, a little 
social awkwardness and, and definitely a fear of conflict. And these things kind of hold me back. I don't like public speaking. <laughs> Sermons are different. But you want me to give a speech over there, I don't like it. But these things, and I'm sure we all have some kind of fear or anxiety that holds us back, that kind of keeps us small. Maybe we're in a job we don't like and we're afraid to go try find something else. Maybe we have a family conflict that we need to talk, but we're going to keep avoiding it. Maybe someone at work always treats us wrong, and we're afraid to stand up for ourselves to make a scene, or we'll be taken wrong, and, and we just come face to face with this often, and we stay small. Don't disturb the waters. Don't rock the boat. I do that a lot. Don't want to rock the boat. But sometimes that's what keeps us from really living. Sometimes that boat needs a good shaking. Sometimes we need to understand what is worse, my fear of rocking the boat or the fear of things remaining the same. This, this continuous anxiety every time I come to work, this continuous anxiety every time I see this coworker who always talks bad about everything and it makes me feel uncomfortable. My neighbor who doesn't appreciate where the, the property line is. Whatever it may be. What is worse? The confrontation or staying small? The humiliation. The fear. The anxiety. Like I said, sometimes that boat needs to be rocked. Sometimes we need to find that strength to overcome those fears, those humiliations, the, these worries. And when we do, we can really feel liberated and free. I was listening to Father Thomas Hopko of Blessed Memory the other day, talking about fear and anxiety. And he says, anxiety, we read throughout the scripture, have no anxiety about this, have no anxiety about that. Do not fear what am I going to eat? He says, you have a pantry full of food. Don't fear, what am I going to have to eat? You have clothes in your closet. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. He says, anxiety is in our head and it's not real. He said, if someone's, you know, sticking you up with a gun, that's real and you ought to be afraid of that. Someone threatening to hurt you with real violence, that's something to be afraid of. A tornado is coming, a hurricane. Those are real things when they're happening. But to have anxiety and worry, what if a hurricane comes? What if I go out and someone tries to mug me? That's a different kind of anxiety that it's in our head. It's not real until you risk it and you can verify whether it was real or wasn't. And many times, right, we verify it wasn't real. I'm such an idiot. I worried for nothing. We do that a lot. We worry for nothing. What if I get sick? What if you don't? What if I go and they laugh at me? What if they don't? What if I quit my job to find a new job and I don't find one? What if you do? What if you like that job better? But our fear and anxiety holds us back. What if I cross myself out in public and people look at me weird? You know, I've had more people tell me, it was so nice to see you do that because we're so afraid to express our faith. I go in my andari and, and they know I'm a priest. They don't know what kind of priest but they know something's up. And they say, what a relief to see you out and about. They need to see this. And I worry, what will they think? It's all in my head. Until they say otherwise, I remain small, right? But what if I got big and, and courageous? 
I would experience new life. I would experience a freedom to live how I feel comfortable to live, how I'm called to live. To deny ourselves is to deny those bad thoughts that come into our head that hold us back. To deny ourselves is to deny those fears that come at us and creep us late at night. They just, they don't stop talking sometimes. To deny ourselves is to overcome that smallness we want to be and not rock the boat, not stand up for ourselves, not to live free. I tell my kids when it's time to learn something new and they say, but ba ba, it's hard. I say, that's all right, you can do hard things. And once they master it, well, how silly I was for being so afraid of it and how great I feel for overcoming it. When Christ picks up his cross, he is crucified and he's humiliated and he's tortured and he's uh, oppressed and persecuted. And on the other side of the cross was the resurrection, was this new life. And he grants that to all of us. And to, for us to deny ourselves, deny those fears, deny those, that anxiety. Put away those worries. Die to that old small self so you may live. We say in our prayers for, for baptism that I no longer become, no longer be a child of flesh, but a child of spirit. No longer belonging to the old man, but to become the new man. As we deny ourselves and pick up our cross, those fears and those anxieties, those, those worries, those things that hold us back from really experiencing our faith. What if it means I need to say no to doing things I enjoy doing. Deny those things that you can truly live. You know, we fast from meat and dairy, and I speak to some people, and they're like, oh, I can never do that. I'm like, why? It's like, I eat meat every day. Do you have to? Oh, yes, I have to. I'm like, you don't have to. Well, my body reacts if I don't have meat, okay? And I really enjoy meat. Well, that's fair too. But what's ruling you? Your stomach, your mouth, your brain, your heart? Like, what do we succumb to? I have to obey my stomach. Pepperoni pizza, I feel like that all the time. I have to, I have to obey it. And I'm like, okay. I'm going to deny myself, be strong, and not have a stomachache later. I'll eat the pizza later. But to be able to deny those things that hold us back, they may seem scary at first, but you have to really weigh, is it better to stay in the small state, the scared state, this high anxiety state, or face that fear and chance and risk becoming something better. Christ shows us the cross comes life. And he challenges us to take that risk. Deny yourself. Tell you things no. That we may die to the old and become new to Christ. And to see that there's freedom in Christ. There's the full life found in Christ when we deny those little passions that hold us back. You know, I think lately I've been tired a lot. And people ask, well, have you been exercising? I'm like, I'm too tired to exercise. But if you exercise, you'll get the blood circulating. And, but I have to deny myself the luxury of a nap. That kind of continues the perpetuation of my tiredness. Well, I don't sleep well at night. Well, because I'm taking a nap during the day. I don't have energy because I'm not exercising. Well, that's a circle that will continue forever until you break the circle. Say, okay, I'm going to push myself a little more today. That, in a way, 
is picking up our cross. Those things that hold us back, those things that we're afraid of, those things that make us small. Pick up the cross. So we may follow him. So we may fully live as Christ has attended us to live. Not in fear, not with anxiety, not with these worries, but risking fullness in our life, risking fullness in our faith. People will ask, you know, if I don't follow God, he'll, he'll send me to hell. And I'm worried about that, and I have a hard time believing in God like that, but also I don't want to go to hell, but I don't like the idea that he would send me to hell. And they get themselves caught in this trap. I'm like, God doesn't want to send any of us to hell. When we choose a life against him, we choose hell. It's our choice. In the Gospel of Mark, he says, if anyone would come after me. In the Gospel of Luke, he says, anyone who desires to come after me. It's an invitation. He's like, I'm not going to punish you if you don't but you don't get the blessings if you don't. It's like I, don't, I can't feel healthy and strong if I'm not willing to exercise. I can't really experience the full blessings of Christ if, if I don't want to follow him. But it's an invitation. We see him reaching out to us. And it's his invitation that we are called to make the most important decision of our life. Will I deny myself, pick up the cross? It's scary, it's hard, it's difficult, and we could be brave and we could do hard things. Let us have that desire so we can overcome those hard and difficult things, that we can have strength to pick up that cross and follow him.